Welcome, Sipsters, to Sip 59. All right, we're getting a little better at that. So uh, the first couple rough edits were, were extremely difficult, Michael. We had, a, had to let some people go for the editing quality. That was unfortunate. Annetta Barger, Ivy, Jan Kiefer, Jeff and Jane Greasy are in the house. Julie Fogarty is in the house. Laurel Robinson, Linda Forsyth, Mark Salazar, Nelson Holden. How are you, sir? Long time no see. So good to have the Sipsters here. We have a jam-packed episode this evening, and I like to, I'll welcome a few more as they come in. Jim Brubaker is here. Uh, you are the Seller Angels algorithm. Each week we do work that we are proud of, and we hope that you also share in the enjoyment of that work and can tell other people about it because that's our algorithm. Uh, there's no app for that. It's just dedication, hard work, and great guests and fantastic wine. Uh, tonight we have the the, the privilege of actually continuing our educational series. And if you remember where we started many weeks ago, we went back to the soil because everything from great wine starts in the vineyard. You have to have good dirt. You have to have good soil. You have to have good clones, good grapes. And all of that starts in the vineyard. From there, we picked clones. From there, we also went to when do we pick? When do we harvest? And then we went into fermentation. And tonight we are gonna go into barrel selection. How do you pick the barrels? Why do you pick certain barrels? How do you determine the age and length of time in barrels? We have the perfect person to help with that educational discussion. And we're gonna be talking about two fantastic wines from his portfolio, a Madeleine Rosé and a Madeleine Red Blend. Uh, the red wine cuvee is something I'm looking forward to because I've been a big fan of the Rosé for about five years now. It is a mainstay at Chateau de Cody, and we have it year round. So before we get into that, I want to let people know that if you want to acquire these wines in advance, it is helpful to go to the Cellar Angels website. Uh, you have to actually go to the Cellar Angels website and underneath the shop wines, you will see current featured wines and also the Cellar Angels ship sip kit. So here is what that looks like. This SIP virtual tasting kit will have four, five, six wines sometimes, and it will be the next four, five, or six consecutive Fridays. The two wines we're tasting this evening are the 2018 Red Blend, the 2019 Rosé. Uh, from our guest, who we are thrilled to have with us again, his second um, foray to Cellar Angels. He survived the first one last June. And uh, I'm thrilled to welcome friend and fantastic winemaker, Michael Trujillo. So Michael, cheers to you on a Friday night. Hey, cheers. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, Jeff and Jane Greasy, if I did not welcome you, welcome. Uh, so Michael, we talked last time, we, we kind of went into your story about a Colorado person on a college spring break I believe we were supposed to go to California to go surfing and, and, and check out the beaches and everything that, you know, all the things that accompany beaches, uh, beverages, beautiful women and those sorts of things and sunshine. And you wound up taking a little detour up to the valley and, and started working at, at a winery that week. Is that, is that accurate? Is my memory failing me? That's pretty, that's actually it. Yeah. yeah. I grew up in Southern Colorado farming and ranching with my father after high school, enrolled into college for engineering, studying engineering. And on my junior year, a couple of buddies and myself, we just headed west. Just like you said, just headed, hitting the beaches, checking it out. We hit the sort of the Southern California scene, very overwhelming for a bunch of farm kids. So we, <laughs> we jumped back in the car and headed north. And actually ended up in Napa Valley through association of a friend of the family. And ironically, you know, if you know my career, that first winery that we pulled down the driveway was Sequoia Grove Winery. And at that time owned and managed by Jim Allen in the Allen family. And that, so that was your first foray, knew nothing about wine as a college student. I don't know how many college students uh, in their third year of college, especially in engineering college are familiar at all with wine, unless you grew up in the Valley and you were smitten with the whole process and, and, and just got bit by the wine bug then? Or, or how did it all happen? Well, it, no. It, 
I didn't grow up with a wine culture at all. My parents were <laughs> big wine drinkers. Uh, I mean, we they made homemade wine that was tasted atrocious. I, <laughs> I wasn't even going to tap into that. But I grew up with beer and bourbon, especially being that we grew a lot of grain and barley for the beer industry. And I didn't grow up with wine. But, you know, landing there at Sequoia Grove and, and Jim Allen and the family, even that first week, we, I wasn't into wine, but I was very, very much captivated by the Napa Valley culture, you know, the camaraderie, the weather was amazing. And uh, it, it, there was just something that made me want to stay. Yeah, there is a, a, a magic to it, an air. It, it's an intangible quality. And because you're right, the weather's amazing. And, and for ha- to someone from Colorado, which gets 300 days of sunshine a year, to say the weather in Napa is amazing is really quite a feat. Yeah, the other thing, too, is Napa Valley has no pesty bugs. I mean, where I grew up, the mosquitoes could eat you alive. <laughs> yeah, for, that's right. I mean, <laughs> so that's a big plus, too. True. So then Sequoia Grove, you worked there for a few years. You actually founded another winery and, and made wine, uh, Carl Lawrence. Yes, but there was, about, there was about eight years that transitioned between that point of my first wine. You know, when I showed up to Sequoia Grove, yeah, we worked for a few days, helped out Jim quite a bit, but his kids were still around, so he could not employ us. Luckily, I found a really awesome job you know, back then to develop vineyard. So I started in the vineyard and because of my little bit of engineering background and, you know, knew how to survey, knew how to engineer irrigation systems, stuff like that. I I rose to the top, to the management level very, very, very quickly developing vineyard. And my first job, ironically, was what's now Domain Carneros. That was my first vineyard that I actually planted. Again, kind of encompassed into the, the whole Sequoia Grove bubble. But I spent about four or five years in the vineyard. That's where I started meeting winemakers. That's where I started getting intrigued with wine. And then um, I was told by the great Andre Chilichev, who was my great mentor and supervisor, and even Jim Allen and many other winemakers, that I had to learn the science. And so I enrolled into the extension program at UC Davis in the late 80s. That's interesting. It's kind of funny because you rarely do you tell an engineer he needs to learn the science because... You obviously have a lot of science behind you. And, and that's fascinating from the Domain Canero standpoint too. But I like that as we were talking about how great wine is made, it's made in the vineyards. And that's where you got your start, which is fascinating because you learned it literally and figuratively from the ground up. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, farming is a science in itself. And even today that science keeps evolving. Um, it, you're exactly right. It all starts in the vineyard. Well, and curious enough, you grew up uh, obviously not from wine in Southern Colorado. Where in Southern Colorado? Uh, right south, the, the central part of the state, just about 20 miles north of the New Mexico border, pretty much right where the Continental Divide passes right through into New Mexico. So uh, there's, a, there's a valley there called the San Luis Valley, which is all about mm-hmm. agriculture. Closest town on the map would be Alamosa, Colorado. Yep. Wow. Okay. So, and you've been out in... California now, Napa specifically, for about 35, 39 years? Uh, yeah, I, I arrived in Napa in 1982. So where are we? About 38, I think. Yeah. You're going to have to do the math because I promise people there's no math on this show. <laughs> I could be wrong, too. <laughs> so I, I'm fascinated by the educational kind of shtick that we're on because most of the, our customers, supporters, and, and, our, and our tribe, they've been to the Valley. They, many of them have been half a dozen, 10 times. And so they know their way around an AVA. They know their way around uh, some of the regions and the bottles and the producers. But when we pull back the veil, I think it's interesting for them to, to learn a little bit about, more about the production side of things. And, and tonight's conversation and uh, educational material and, and fun stuff is going to be on barrel selection. And, and barrels if people do a little bit of research on them, it very much mirrors kind of, in my opinion, the wine industry where you have uh, negotiants on barrels. You have coopers that actually work with certain growers of certain trees that have been doing this for generations in France. And they actually market those, those trees and those forests and those families and there's relationships. And then those coopers bring that information and that service to the United States. And I'm curious, 
how, based upon learning everything you've learned over the last 39 years, what type of role does the barrel play in the wine that you're producing? In my mind, for the style of wines that I make and that I like to make, the barrel plays a very critical role. But I'm a winemaker that wants to state that the barrel for me is a vehicle of maturing the wine, not a vehicle of flavoring the wine. The flavor is a, is a secondary bonus component that comes from the barrel. But more importantly, it's, it's, it's the vehicle of maturity. So every different varietal, sometimes different AVAs, different styles of wine, you know, different vintages. It's like a, a gas pedal on your car. You know, how, how much do you push the gas? How much do you not push the gas? So in my mind, it's a, it's a big moving variable from vintage to vintage on which barrels, how much barrels, how much time, et cetera. And has, has the, stylistically, the wine that you're wanting to produce, has that changed over the years as you've learned not only the region that you're in, but maybe your own personal style and your own personal preferences? Not really. I mean, I, I'm not heavy handed with oak because I'm not trying to flavor the wine with oak. You know, we went through an era here about a decade ago where, you know, the more oak, the better. I've never been that way. For me, you know, I monitor how much oak I put into a wine by, by how dense and how muscular and how, how bold the wine is. The bolder the wine, the more I need new barrels. The, the mellower, the lighter, the more simpler wines, less new oak, but I definitely need oak, you know, just for maturing the wine. And uh, I do have a couple poll questions. We'll, we'll launch our first poll question here. And then at the bottom of the hour, uh, for the attendees that desire to, to put their cameras on, Denise will, uh, Mission Control will make that happen. And you can ask Michael a question uh, in person, so to speak. But our first poll question actually has to do with oak barrels. And the larger the oak barrel, the more surface area in contact with the wine and the greater the flavor impact. True or false? And you can't answer, Michael. I know you figured this much. <laughs> I'll drink <laughs> while you guys are doing it. <laughs> that works. Uh, because I'm fascinated by the types of forest, the types of wood, the, the cost of the barrel, the aging process. And I'll give you this three more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay. So we've got one person who took a risk and flipped a coin and said true. And we have eight people that are correct. So uh, false, the, the surface area in contact with the wine is actually, that's more, in smaller barrels. So the larger the barrel, there's actually less surface area contact with the wine. A little bit of a trick question, but uh, I'm interested in the barrel size and, and barrel selection. Now, you don't use 100% new oak, but these barrels are expensive. How do you make the determination on what percentage of new oak you use? To me, when I, when I harvest and the wine comes in, you can right away, for me, I monitor how bold and how much extraction and you know the vintage is, is it giving us a lot it, does it need more vehicle for maturity so if that's the case it's going to get a heavy hand of new oak on the other hand if it's a lighter vintage a cooler vintage and we've had some vintages that are a little bit lighter you know 2011 2000 you definitely don't want to be smothering it with too much oak so there you're going to reel back so for me for the wines i make if i'm talking cabernet you know, my rule of thumb is about 75 to 80 percent, but there's vintages that I go as high as 90. And if I'm dealing with it, like just this stellar wine that I deal with, like Powell Mountain or Morizoli Vineyard in Rutherford, you know, sometimes those are 100 percent new oak, but you'll never perceive it tasting oaky. And the reason is because, is you know, that that barrel is is microscopically breathing wine. It's aspiring you know, water and alcohol, it's letting the wine evolve. So if you think of it that way, a brand new barrel is virgin, the, the pores of the wood are open, everything about that barrel is fresh. So, so the, the rate of maturity to the wine is faster in a new barrel than it would be in an older barrel. 
older barrel being a little bit more clogged, tartrate, so on and so forth. So new barrels, in my mind, mature the wine faster. And the, um, let's say you have a winery or a winemaker that says, I use 100% new oak every year. And, they, and I've heard them say this, and they say that as kind of a badge of honor. If I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, that would be a mistake because when you have lighter years or leaner years, the new oak will smother that wine and you should probably taper the oak back to let some of that wine evolve. And then other years you have extremely expressive years where the new oak could complement it. Would that be a fair statement? Uh, I would say yes and no to that answer because to add a whole nother layer of complexity to everything is what barrel, what toasting level, what forest, what, how tight is your grain. So you could put a hundred percent new oak on a lighter wine if you make the right barrel and toast selection. So, you know, a barrel can go everything from a very light dainty toast all the way to a very heavy smoky, you know, charred sugars of the wood. So there's this big extreme of what the barrel has to offer. And how far in advance do you have to purchase the barrel to anticipate this decision? You know, we order our barrels like now. I mean, March, April, we're getting our barrels ordered for the upcoming harvest. Um, okay. You know, when I was in my younger years, I was ordering, I had more experiments going on and, you know, I was trying <laughs> to track barrels. And you know, now that I'm a little bit more seasoned, I do have my favorite Coopers that I, I continuously like what I've discovered over my years. I throw a barrel or two in for experiment once in a while, but um, there's a bazillion variables and I don't have time to, to chase them all anymore. Well, and it's funny you just said that because as you were just talking about the variables of toast and smoke uh, to basically add wrinkles to barrel selection, you're buying barrels now for this year's harvest, but you don't know what you're going to have right now. So you're kind of putting you know, a little bit of a wager on the come line because you don't know what's going to happen. So if you're bu buying barrels, I can imagine, that you, I mean, what happens if it's a lighter harvest and you win 100% oak or new oak, new French oak, you're like, oh boy. And now how do I, what, what tip, tricks and tips can you do then to, to dial it back a little? You know, we have, we have safety measures. We, we order okay. enough oak in anticipation of our average percent. Let's just, for me, let's just say that average percentage is 80%. If the vintage comes in light, I will keep more of my used barrels around versus selling them off for something. And I, I can either negotiate with the Cooper to lighten up my new order, which the Coopers are amazing. Mm -hmm. They're very, they, they work with you because you know, right. they have different parts of the world they can sell these new barrels. And or I can store them until the next harvest and, and incorporate them then. Oh, that's a good point. And these are not inexpensive assets, are they? Not at all. Anywhere from a thousand to twelve hundred for a French oak barrel, and somewhere in the range of you know five to seven hundred for an American. So it's interesting. And uh, Peter Glick, welcome this evening. Good to see you. Uh, I had a discussion recently with someone about costs of wines in Napa Valley and and the expense of it. Is specifically the limited production, the, the you know the smaller artisan wineries, and it, they said it seems their wines are more expensive. And I said they are, and there's a good reason for that, because labor of hand harvesting, hand sorting, you know, all the pressing, the, the selection, a lot of them are putting on their own labels, that sort of stuff. The barrel is expensive. All that adds to the cost that you don't have in an industrialized winery where it's just the same wine every single year. Right. And, and you, you are certainly a testament to that. I do want to show a quick video uh, for folks. When we talk about barrel selection and, and essentially forest to Cooper, this is exactly what that looks like.
Damien is the name of the Cooper here in France. Now this I think is amazing, where they take the staves out and they put them outside for 24 to 36 months and age them and cure them outdoors. There's that toast you're talking about. I'm amazed at how much manual labor is involved. And you can see a lot of that. You, we talk about generations of master craftsmen and master coopers and this organization, the Teme uh, Cooperage, they've received awards in France for the, the best worker in France, which I don't know how they judge that. But it is amazing that you can see the level of detail and why they're so expensive and how much pride and care they take in, in the barrel selection because they know what's going to be on the other end. And that's you and your wine selection. Did you, you said you have your favorite Cooper. Who's that? Oh, am I marketing for my Cooper? <laughs> <laughs> you know, with all honesty, I, I've had great luck with Terrence O. Um, I use Demtos quite a bit. Uh, Valverine is another one that I use. Uh, but then for Chardonnays, it's Marcinet. White wines, I'll use Marcinet. I, I have a selection of Coopers for individual uh, wines. That the, and, and is this kind of... Uh, tried and true over the years so you just had a good experience so you go back to that cooper and or, or um, learn from others for my style and again i want to you know every every winemaker is going to have a different style for my style of red wines i have my top five coopers and i have my top five coopers for white wines however i will always throw in something new or some new technology or something that's introduced i mean there's Every vintage, there's a new technology that comes forth with the use of barrels. And then I think you mentioned earlier, you're able to say, I need X number of barrels with this level of toast. I need X number of barrels with, so you've got complete control over dialing in specificity of things that you want associated with the, with the barrels. We do when we order them. We can't necessarily have a hundred percent guarantee when we get them. But, uh, you know, we, we have to rely heavily on our relationship with the Coopers. Um, I mean, you hear crazy stories of people getting things that they didn't order, but the Coopers that I deal with are, are very restful and they're consistent year after year. If, if I didn't have a consistency, and, and believe me, I've gone through that with Coopers where they become one of my top five and then over the next four or five vintages, they, they just lack luster on me. And so, you know, I'll switch out. So. Smart. Even with there, there can be some rippling with consistency and, and that 
there's a lot of reasons that we understand why. Um, but you know, reliable, just like wine, just when you go to buy a great wine or you go to buy my wine, you're going to, you're going to want to be able to rely on it being consistent. True. But I also think there's, you have to also respect and appreciate kind of that vintage variation, which we always talk about because you mentioned 2011, two very lean years, and those are going to be different than, you know, 13, 15, all the way back. So I think that's kind of the fun uh, of, of wine. I probably don't think it would be that fun in barrels, though, if you want that consistency in barrels. You know, the barrel's not, I mean, if, as long as you don't go on an, an extreme tangent, even if you did an experimental batch of barrels that are, you know, three, four, five percent of your production, it's not going to wreck anything. It, you know, you mm -hmm. just have to divert that wine either to a different blend or, or make a different plan for it. You know, the stuff that goes to the top, the great barrels, they go into your great wines and they go into your reserve wines. So, I mean, it's and crazy. In my career, I've actually made wine in barrels from everywhere, from China, uh, Czechoslovakia, you know, all around the globe. That's pretty interesting. Is, is there a, a difference significantly? You talked about China, Hungarian, Czechoslovakia. Specifically, we, we hear a lot about American oak versus French oak. What is the main differences between those two? I do believe that every single region brings something different, just like in wines that we have Tawar and ABA. The same goes for where trees grow. Then add to that the technology of how they're made and how they're seasoned and you know, that video that you just showed, showed all of us, you know, it's the seasoning of the wood. It's the selection of the wood. It's, you know, it's all just layers and layers and layers of multiple choices. Um, right. But yeah, I've, you know, some of the wines that came from the barrels that came from Asia, huh? they, they, they didn't stay long in the program. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have our uh, second polling question. Mark Shalinor, how are you doing, sir? So we'll get this one underway. Our second of final. So uh, quite a few of you got the first one right. The most common red wine barrel in the United States is 228 liters. And I did the conversion for you because I know sooner or later we will convert to the metric system that we were warned about 40 years ago, but so far it hasn't caught on. Uh, so that's 60 gallons. How many bottles of wine on average does that barrel hold? 120, and no cheating. No, no, put your, put your smartphones down. 375.5, 425. While you ponder that, I'm going to take a sip of the rosé. All right. Five seconds left. Three, two, one. All over the board. <laughs> but... Uh, if those of you maybe did some simple math in their head and realized a barrel holds about 25 cases and 25 times 12 is in fact 300. So 300 bottles in a single barrel of wine, give or take how much the angels have gotten, so to speak. And do you use barrels? I think you use them more than once. You don't use 100% new French oak. So how do you determine what's 80%? How do you do that math? Um before I answer that question, so how many barrels of wine do you drink <laughs> a year? <laughs> how many barrels or how many bottles? How many barrels of how many barrels of wine do you drink a year? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. We don't measure it in bottles any longer. We measure it in barrels. <laughs> yes. So, so a barrel of wine annually is not too far fetched. Um, no, that's actually pretty good. That's close. Yeah. So, uh, how do I select? The question is, how do I select the percentage? Because well, if you have a yeah, if it's 100%, this is where the math has got to get crazy. And you talked a, a few minutes ago where you, where you said, you know, 5% or something like this isn't going to ruin your production or, or ruin that vintage, so to speak. But I'm you are saying that now with 39 vintages under your belt. I would imagine some of the younger guns, so to speak, that are coming up, they're still white knuckled with these decisions and recognizing that, okay, I'm only producing four barrels of wine, so I can't screw this up. And they, they don't know how to work in a neutral barrel or a, a three-year-old barrel and stuff like that. So how do you factor that in if you've got, is it all just math? I've got 10 barrels, eight of them are brand new, two of them are two years old. So that's 80% new oak. 
the rough plan is exactly that the very rough plan when you go to order barrels you have a exactly how you said it i'm going to order 80 percent new for x amount of expected tons per vintage once the wines ferment and come off of fermentation and press out you then know uh oh i better not use so much oak or hey i may need a little more and keep in mind we can always go to our coopers and order more barrels so you know there's nothing wrong even today nowadays with economics and everything that we're doing you know we even order a little bit more conservative because we can always go back to our cooper and say hey i need five more barrels of this or you know three more barrels of that um you know i've learned that over time i mean i i caught my, i've been many vintages where i had a lighter style vintage and then all of a sudden i have you know fifteen thousand dollars worth of barrels that i'm not going to use so we've learned the hard way not to get too carried away on ordering new barrels. Yeah, that, I can imagine that that you have to be very careful of that at twelve hundred dollars a pop. Yeah. So the the wines in barrel, and then there's the uh, concept of racking. Talk to us about what racking is and and why you do it. Well, racking mainly is to, as the wine settles, it'll throw its sediment down to the bottom of the barrel more so even when the wine junger you know it's your spent yeast you know your ml fermentation the solids of the, the the wine itself when you press it away so the first initial rackings are mainly kind of just to separate itself from the rough sediment and or a lot of times the wine just needs to be brought up and manipulated kind of aerated a little bit you might say just freshened up a little bit and then you rinse all that the barrel you rinse it with you know good water we use ozone sometimes ozone ozonated water and then you you mix the wine and you put it back into a nice clean vessel if you're doing so a so you take you take all the wine out of the barrel and you put it where while it's while you're cleaning the barrel in a, in a large tank in a large tank unless you're doing a, a very specific barrel experiment if you're doing a very specific barrel experiment you'll you'll wreck out and back to the same barrel Okay. And as we're discussing racking, uh, Mission Control is allowing folks to turn on their cameras if they, in fact, would like to. There's the longs. So, so how soon after the wine is in barrel, the first time, will you do the first racking? It all depends, but usually it's going to be shortly after malolactic fermentation complete, which is usually somewhere spring on a red wine, spring, March, April, May. So I like to wait until I'm done with secondary fermentation. Now I, back in the early years of my winemaking, I was very, very anxious to rack and get away from the sediment. Today, I'm not as anxious. Some of those, those secondary characters that come from that sediment are very, very welcome to the wine. The only time you're gonna kind of rush for a racking is when the wine is what we call reduced. You know, it right. kind of gets a little eggy in a sense, you know, off aromas. And so you'll, you'll want to get away from whatever is causing that. And then how many times will you rack? I mean, it probably depends upon how long you're going to have it aged in barrel, or is there a time where you, okay, we're no more racking. It differs. I, like white wine, for instance. If I'm making a Chardonnay, I don't rack it at all until I'm ready to bottle it. Cause I want to be in contact with that sediment through the entire life of the wine. Cause it adds secondary characters to the wine and texture. Red wine, like I said, back in, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we were racking a lot because we were kind of too nervous. Nowadays, twice, maybe, for the life of the wine. And if I'm huh. racking a wine, a lot of times it's just to start assembling the blend lots, you know, putting right. parts A, B, and C together with, you know. But I, I don't have a problem with wine being undisturbed in the barrel nowadays. And that's different from when you first started out. Oh, yeah. We were, we were always manipulating wine in my early career. <laughs> See, that's, that's the benefit of wisdom. And patience. Patience is, you know, wisdom and patience is very rewarding to wine. And you mentioned, and you said this sentence a couple of times where you started the sentence by saying the types of wines I like to make. And then you went on to explain some aspects of how you do that what are the types of wines you like to make so for me all of my wines whether i'm making a wine that has no oak like a white blend or a sauvignon blanc or a rosé or something like that 
all the way to my reserve big bad boy Cabernets, I definitely want every single wine to come forth with the varietal expression of from what it's made from. I don't want any interference from barrel or alcohol or anything from the wine. I want my wines to express what they're made from and even fine tune where they're, you know, what vineyards, what to are, what AVA they're made from. So for me, the barrel is, is very critical to have perfect synergy with the wine. Because if there's anything that sticks out, and believe me, there's barrels that can be a little too aggressive. You know, I, I don't want that. I want the wine to speak first. I, like I'd like to say, I, I like to put the bling in the bottle, not the barrel in the bottle. <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, we've learned over the years that the skin contact with the juice is what causes the tannin, but you can also get tannin from barrel. Well, so, so how do you not go? so much skin. Your, your biggest culprit in a fermentation is your seeds and stems. Mm. I, mean, I mean, that's the reason we go through great measures to, to make sure we're removing stems. And nowadays, we're even getting more critical on removing seeds. Um, and yes, there's tannin in the skin too, especially in certain varietals. But tannins aren't a bad thing. Tannins are very important in a wine, especially when you're making it because they're your they're your vehicle or your binder to the really special things in wines, complex anthocyanins, you know, maintaining color. There's a lot of things about tannin that are important. And so the tannin also softens with age in the barrel. And then you go from barrel aging to bottle aging. How do you determine how long your, your regular red, red wine program or your big bad boys, the determination of barrel length, barrel aging time? For my type of winemaking with red wines, 22 to 24 months is, is right where I want to be. And there's a number of reasons for it. If you think about a wine cellar, we crush and we age it for two years. And we, we kind of have to make room for the, the, the third crush coming. In other words, we got to empty up some barrels, bottle the wine and make room in our cellars to receive the next harvest. I have made wines that I aged longer that go beyond that two and a half years in the barrel. I've gone as high as three years in the barrel. There's a whole different dynamic that happens to the wine when you age for a longer period of time. When I see that difference, longer aging, you will sacrifice a little bit of the fruit of the wine, but in return, you'll, you'll get texture to the wine. So for me, I'm a guy that likes to have my wines in barrels for about 22 to 24 months. Well, and there, in, again, is another factor in the economics of the bottle price because, or certainly in the decision-making process, right? Because now you, you have a $1,200 barrel and you have the wine resting in the barrel for 22 to 24 months. So there's two years without essentially revenue. And then some folks, you know, will do it for 36 months. Uh, and if you're in Spain, oftentimes it's 60 months. And so all of that weighs into the complexity, the nuances, the layering of flavors. It's got to be a little bit stressful to determine when you want to go to market out of the barrel and into the bottle. And then do you bottle age as well? Yes. Um, wine, the bottling process of wine is, it, it's a little rough on wine coming out of the barrel, going through the spouts into the bottle, vacuum corking and all that stuff, you know, trucking, packaging. You know, we like to see wine at least rest for a minimum of six months post-bottling. A year is even better. You know, if you can release the wine a year after you bottle it, it gives the time for the wine to rebound and relax and get back to where it was right before you bottled it. Interesting. And is that the same for white wine as well? Yes, I would say so. Um, I, you know, I've, re I've released wines early in my career. And then you look back and say, man, if I could have just held on for like another six months, it would have been awesome. You know, this, they, they, they come around by the time they're sold out, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I do want to uh, actually, we'll, we'll show some, some aspects of barrels uh, in, in our famous globe of Google Earth. So we talk about, and this is a rare view for us because we normally start in the United States. So uh, we're going to hone in on France because 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say most of the French oak comes from France. So we look at three different forests, the Allier forest. And it, it's funny, Michael, without prompting, you talked about this earlier with regards to where these forests are located. And, and this one is in, in the center of France, uh, not near Switzerland. So it's, it's kind of flat, tepid area of France. And this is a huge forest uh, where these trees are 100 years of age, oak trees uh, that are harvested specifically for barrel making. And you can see some of these have been picked clean. Uh, but then as you move further away or up, up in northern part of France, you have another forest. And this one now is closer to Switzerland. So you're higher elevation. So that's going to impact because the oxygen level is a little bit less. The winters are a little bit harsher. And so you're looking at this, the density of this forest as well. And I don't know if you get geeky enough or if you've gotten geeky enough over the years where some winemakers are like, I want my barrels from the trees on the perimeter because, and this, I'm honest to goodness, Michael heard this from a winemaker in Napa from a very prominent winery that he indicated he likes the trees from the perimeter of the forest because there's a lot of wildlife that goes around the perimeter of the forest urinates on the trees and you get a different degree of funkiness from the trees on the perimeter to the trees in the center that are more sheltered. Now he could have been tasting all day and spinning a yarn, uh, but I'd be curious if you've heard any stories along that line. Well, I frown upon that. Um, <laughs> you know, just the process, as we all know, I mean, in order for that winemaker to get that specific tree you gotta think about it that tree is going to be milled just like we mill lumber how are they going to track that particular tree through a process of lumbering trucking milling right. aging barrel stick collection state i mean yeah i doubt that they can track the trees but i i don't know maybe he has a way to do it and and then this last forest, I mean, there's there's lots of forests in France, but this one is right on this uh, the border, and so it's even much higher in elevation. So it would be interesting to taste barrels from or the impact of barrels on, on from these three. Uh, but the cooperage that we did see is in Mersal, uh, in the heart of Burgundy, and so it's interesting that you can see right here all of those staves just outdoors in the elements for 24 to 36 months aging and curing. And, and can you pick the one that the deer peed on? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's lot number 22417, yeah. I cannot. But, but let me add to the complaint. You, see, you just showed the different forests and the same goes for American oak here. What, what gives the character to each one of them forests is mainly climate. The cooler the climate, the denser the wood. Same goes for wood that we source from America. If we're sourcing in Missouri, it's gonna be a lot warmer than it's gonna be say in Pennsylvania or Minnesota. And right. those, those woods, same with, you know, Nevers is kind of the more open grain wood of France. And then you can get into the tighter grains of Allier and Chance. And what you're tasting the difference of is the density of the wood. Interesting. And now I would, I would imagine, has anybody ever done anything with kind of the reclaimed lumbers that are in Lake Superior, Northern Minnesota, and some of those uh, old age timbers that have been submerged for a hundred years in Lake Superior? Not that I know of, but it sounds a little scary. Well, they're in pristine waters of 35, 36 degrees, and it's some of the best wood in the world because of what you talked about, the density. And uh, there's a whole, whole industry for reclaimed lumber uh, but I've never seen anybody do it with oak or with barrels because I, I would imagine it might be well, cost my, prohibitive. Well, my red flag goes up for what bacteria, bacterial elements have entered the wood. Interesting. So now let's get to a region that we're much more familiar with than the woods of France. And that would be the wine region of Napa and Sonoma. And specifically, I want people to come visit Trujillo and taste with you. And when you get to Napa, get out of Napa City Center, head up Valley, go past Yountville and go to St. Helena because this is where it's a little bit uh, 
the road less traveled, if you will, but I know Michael's familiar with the traffic, so it's not that much less traveled. Uh, but it, it is, here you have Harvest Inn, if you're familiar with that hotel. And then here you have the Trujillo Tasting Room right up the road. And uh, I'll even zoom in. It's just on the outskirts of St. Helena. Here you have the wonderful Farmstead Restaurant, which I've been known to eat at three times in three days. Uh, I highly recommend the ribs if they have enough. But this little tasting room is very, very uh, intimate, friendly. But Michael, you guys have also built out some things in the back. Tell us a little bit about the tasting room. Oh, yeah. We had to scramble when COVID shut us down last year. So we, we put in a whole back patio, you know, put in a garden center patio, covered patio. Uh, our, our guests are loving sitting outside and just relaxing. And then your views are out towards the Mayacamas Mountains. And um, so the outdoor, we've all adjusted outdoors and it's actually been a great benefit. We still have indoor, you know, on a hot day, we have air conditioned tastings, you know, indoors. Um, I have a great team. I mean, my, my team that works with me are amazing. We, we, we love hosting and, and a lot of great wines. No, a lot of great wines. And it's interesting. I mean, this isn't a bad view out the back here. Look at the Mayakamas. It's, huh? it, it, it doesn't get old. And I know uh, we'll be out there in July with uh, some folks. Uh, the Mannings are out there and I, I think they'll be with us. And I think Sean is on tonight, but we're going to be stopping by this tasting room because it's a, it's a lot of fun from, from a tasting experience. Uh, we've talked about the cost of barrel, length of time, racking. I'd be curious, now with 39 vintages under your belt, were there any mistakes that you had to learn the hard way on these decisions? Um, not necessarily. I mean, there have been experiments or trials that have gone astray, you know, less, less favorable, you might say. Um, yeah, learn. You just learn from your wisdom. You learn from trial. You got to do trials and error. And, you know, the great thing about this industry here in Napa is we share and taste with our fellow winemakers. I mean, not only my experiments, but I don't know. I've sat in numerous times with other winemakers and tasted their trial, their, their barrel trials. And, um, you know, I make my wine and I consult my consulting winemaking that I do is at Matera Winery in Napa. And that's a custom crush facility that we have very high-end, high-talented winemakers making wine. And it's a joy to taste barrels, oak chip experiments. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff happening out there. So not only do I get to do my trial and error, I get to, you know, be a guest to tasting other people's wines a lot too. I like that. I, I'm going to come back to that point about other people's wines in a second, but I want you to give us a, a flavor profile assessment of the rosé. This is, uh, it's great because it's the 2019. I know you're drinking the 2020. Uh, this is something that we buy in case quantities because as you know, we have to live up to one barrel of wine a year. So, <laughs> so, so this happens to be one of our favorites, but talk to us about this rosé. You source the food from up in Mendo. Why up there? Okay, so I I did pull a 19 out of my cellar. So knowing okay, that I was going to do this tonight, I did I did I did want to be talking apples to apples, we may say. When I make a rosé, I'm going to be after the. I want the acidity of the wine, so I want to be I want it to be coming from a cooler region. Um, so that's one reason that I go up to Mendocino area. I like to have that natural acidity. But I'm, you know, I'm not just locked into Mendocino. There, there's some great Grenache and Malvedra that grows all around California. So when I make this Madeleine Rosé, I'm more focused on maintaining my style, making sure it's a vibrant, fruit forward, very refreshing Rosé. So I'm not boxed into one Pacific source for grapes. Matter of fact, the, the Rosé and the white wine that I make can you know, variable, have variables with uh, the varietals that I use. And are you taking inspiration from uh, Provence or certain regions, or are you after stylistically a certain flavor profile of rosé? No, and I don't mean to sound pompous about this, 
That's fine. I love all those wines. I love drinking them. The Madeline wine, the label of Madeline is named after my daughter. And if you look, you know, the main label for me is my surname, Trujillo. Madeline is a wine that I just want to be fun, whimsical, have fun when you're drinking. I'm not trying to be like anybody else. A matter of fact, my blends under the Madeline label are very, very unique. An example being that my white wine under Madeline label, and by the way, Madeline is named after my daughter, Sophia Madeline. The white wine is, is, is Sauvignon Blanc and Gewurz demeanor. It's, it's right. bright, bright, vibrant. This rosé is usually Grenache, you know, Syrah, sometimes Malvedra. But I want this rosé to come across as sort of that strawberry shortcake. I'm not trying to be that dainty Provence little rose petal rosé, nor am I trying to be white Zinfandel. I just want to be, Thank I you. want to sit on your patio and consume the whole bottle and maybe go get another one. <laughs> See, um, Denise, <laughs> let the record reflect that consuming a whole bottle is okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's encouraged by the winemaker. Um, but, I mean, the Madeline wines for me, for those of you that know my label and know me, if you look at the, I mean, I mean, if you look at the label in itself, you know, it's the back pocket of a pair of denim jeans. You know, over here, I got the little tab with the alcohol. You can feel the texture of denim. You know, when you're wearing your jeans, you're relaxing, you're chilling. And same thing goes for this, this line of wine. Just... I have no problem calling my Madeline White and Rosé patio pounders. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I like the whimsical part of it, too, because you, if we go on up to your portfolio, we do have the big bad boys that can stand on their own that, that are, you know, hear me roar type of uh, testosterone bottles. Uh, but this is that more whimsical one that you can sit on the lanai, the patio, whatever, the picnic, the beach, and just have at it. And, and it's delightful and delicious. Tell, let's let's dig deep a little deeper on the cuvee. So the red wine, the red wine cuvee, plays a very important role to my whole my whole machine, you might say. I in my thirty five years of making wine, I've I've made wine from every square mile of Napa Valley. I know where I want to be making and sourcing grapes for my cabernets. So I purposely overbuy knowing that I'm going for my business model and my business plan, I will have extra wine that will spill away from the main labels, not because they're inferior or, or lack anything. They're aged in French oak. They're aged in 75 to 80%. They get the Royal treatment. They just may not weave perfectly into my main Trujillo cat. It's a balance thing. It's a, it's a, it's a consistency. It's a profile thing that I'm looking at. So I have these, pieces you may say a couple of gallon, hundred gallons of this couple of gallons of that a barrel of this a barrel of that and i regather those wines and i reassemble them making a secondary blend and in my in my mind i want to make a more fun whimsical easy drinking sexy red wine how do i do that i purposely drive the cabernet percentage downward and and bring up more Merlot, bringing that raspberry, bringing that soft texture, bringing Cab Franc for the aromatics. And so this Madeline red wine helps me keep the Trujillo main Cabernet consistency into its perfection. And then the byproduct will be just a fun wine that can be enjoyed with burgers, pizza, meatloaf. Um, you know, it's just an easy drinking, sexy red wine. And it's it's serious, but at the same time with that label and the packaging and where I'm putting it, it's, it's meant to be fun and easy more than anything. Well, and it, it's meant to be fun, easy, and approachable as well. So this isn't a wine that you have to lay down for seven to 10 years. No, but it does very much benefit from, from time yeah. in the cellar. So, and I can definitely see, I mean, it is actually, the mouthfeel on this is fantastic. It, and that might be the velvetness of the Merlot, but um, it is a beautifully aromatic wine. And I love the flavor profile on it. Yeah. I'm curious, you, talk, you talked earlier, and I said I would come back to it, that you get to visit with a lot of other winemakers and drink their wines as well. Do you have a, a, a you know, a, a top five or a top two or three uh, wines that you like to go to that are not in the Trujillo portfolio? 
I do. I, I like, you know, for me, I love tasting stuff all around the globe. I mean, it, it's just so interesting to taste stuff from South America, you know, France, Burgundy. Uh, my all-time favorite wines, even though I don't make any of these outside of Chardonnay, I love Burgundy. But mm -hmm. my colleagues, I'll, I'll chase a wine in California more for the reputation of the winemaker more than I will the brand or the points that the critics give it. I like to rely on the, on the winemaker or the producer. So I have a handful of winemakers that not only do I drink their wines often, you know, I trade we'll trade back and forth or I'll even go out and buy them. But uh, so for me, the answer would be that I, I like the styles of certain winemakers. And do these winemakers have names? Yeah, I mean, I, I respect what like Pam Starr's doing, Ken Bernard with Ancien. Um, yeah, a number of winemakers. I'm now working side by side with Chelsea Barrett at Matera. She's a brilliant winemaker. And then, you know, her family is, there's some great wines that come from the Barrett family. Yeah, so just a I'm, few. <laughs> I'm very blessed. You know, we, uh, Chelsea Barrett is now the lead winemaker at Matera, which is one of the wineries that I consult for. And, you know, she's been on board now for a couple of harvests and it's just fun. I mean, it's just fun tasting with, you know, the whole team and her circle of winemakers and young winemakers and veteran winemakers. It's, it's a lot of fun. No, I, I can't imagine it, it, it could be anything but fun. And I'd be uh, interested too, if there's any panelists that want to ask a question of Michael, either throw it in the chat, or if you want to turn on your mic, I, I'm happy to, you can go ahead and, and voice it. Uh, but but I, I think it's kind of funny. I, I There's a sports analogy there too, because when you, when you talk to, uh, Mark Salazar has a question. Yes, uh, what's your production and now that you're very seasoned in what you do, uh, would you like to increase your production, keep it the same? Uh, what's your outlook on that? Great question. For those of you that may know my career, I was the head winemaker and president of Sequoia Grove Winery. It's a, a full circle. I landed there in 1982. And I actually, over time, ended up being the president and CEO and head winemaker for that same winery. Crazy. We, we were making 50,000 cases there. But in order to move 50,000 cases, it does take a small army. Now, I used to own a brand called Carl Lawrence, which is my middle name and, and my first partner's middle name. And that was about 3,000 cases. I, for where I want to be in my career today, I, I like to think that the sweet spot is about 3,000, 3,500 cases. Reason being is if I can sell, you know, 75% of that direct to my consumer and a little bit of wholesale, it's a very good living, not only for me, but for about three employees. It's a perfect scenario. If I go bigger or I go beyond that, I definitely need to bring on more support, more employees, more wholesale, more distributors, more marketing expenses, so on and so forth. So for me right now, my goal is, is to about 3,500 cases. I'm currently about 2,000 right now. And I think I can make a very good living and have time to go garden and have time to go ride my bike and go hiking and go on vacation and not get sucked up into the rat race. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. Uh, anybody else have a question that I'm missing that I didn't cover? Good. Michael, you have been outstanding as usual. And uh, I've, this has been extremely informative, both on your personal style, the longevity of this decision-making process, what you're after in wine, uh, the barrel processes, fraught with peril it seems but after 39 vintages you kind of i won't say you're on autopilot but you've got a few of it dialed in with very nice and so mother nature i'm sure has a few tricks up her sleeves but you found a way to counteract them and the wines speak for themselves so uh, you've got a very nice pedigree of portfolio in our opinion with regards to yes you have those stellar wines that are just absolutely jaw-dropping in the trujillo line but then you also recognize the need 
for some of the more approachable wines that are fun, that are patio pounders, that don't have to be so darn serious type of stuff that are just enjoyable to have with the, you know, a variety of different foods and a dozen or more different occasions. So for that, thank you for recognizing the need and, and capitalizing on that. And cheers to that. Hey, thank you. Good to be here as always. So this is always fun. Good. And um, I know you have a, I think, a, a large piece of meat marinating on the counter. So I want to make certain you get to that. Uh, everyone else, be, be good to one another. Look for the new summer schedule, which will be out. We're going to take a little bit of some time off. Next week, we are with Lise Asamant, and we are going to be deep diving into the Russian River Valley. Uh, you all have been fantastic. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Stay healthy. Stay safe. 